If you want to pump your body and expand your mind, there's only one place to go. Mind Pump. Mind Pump. With your hosts, Sal Stefano, Adam Schaefer, and Justin Andrews. Welcome to Mind Pump. Now, we are known as a fitness podcast, but we really are a health podcast. So we like to cover topics that uh, fit in the sphere of health. Usually, that means we're talking about exercise and nutrition, but sometimes we talk about spirituality, relationships, um, and uh, public policy. Um, right now, now we're, we're based out of California, and in California in particular, we have witnessed ourselves this explosion of homelessness. Um, I, we, I have never seen tent cities pop up in my hometown of San Jose, and over the last five years, I've seen them pop up all over the place. And so what we wanted to do is we wanted to do an episode where we talk to an expert on this subject that could prob- possibly shed some light on this health epidemic that isn't just affecting the the homeless themselves, but is now starting to affect all of us. Um, and of course, we care. We care about uh, the people who are sick, and we care about people who aren't sick who are being affected by this. So this episode is a little bit different, but again, we believe that it it contributes to the entire sphere of total health. So this is an informative uh, episode. We interviewed Dr. Drew Pinsky. Uh, he is a doctor. He's been on uh, he's been on media for a very very long time, but more recently, this has become one of his missions. His mission is to change public policy to solve the homeless issue. And so in this episode, we ask him like how bad the problem really is, uh, especially here in California. Um, what are some of the potential harms this has on society? What is causing the problem? We hear a lot about affordable housing and how it's so expensive in California and why, uh, how that may be contributing to the issue. He totally, totally disagrees and sheds some light on this problem. Now, in this episode, we ask, we also asked his opinion on the current state of the coronavirus, uh, you know, shelter in place, how it's affecting the homeless population. So if you are interested in health and general health and you want to kind of shed some light on a problem that may be affecting you and your town, we think you're going to really enjoy this interview and this episode. You can find Dr. Drew on his website, drdrew.com, drdrew.com. Now, I do want to let everybody know before the episode starts that you have one day left to take advantage of our core training ab workout program. It's called the No BS Six Pack Formula. This is a full workout for your abs, for your core. It was designed to develop your midsection so that your, your muscles are more visible even at higher body fat percentages. Now, the program is half off with this promotion. Again, you have one day left. Um, and with the discount, the, t- the whole program, Life Access, it's only $28.50. By the way, this program also comes with a 30-day money-back guarantee, so you have nothing to lose. Here's how you get that discount. Go to nobs6pack.com. That's N-O-B-S, the number six, P-A-C-K.com, and use the code NOBS50. That's N-O-B-S-5-0, no space, for the discount. I wanted to talk to you about something that you've been more recently um, quite vocal about. Uh, I, I would consider you one of the, I think, leading experts on this particular subject, especially in the state of California. And uh, I'm referring to the homelessness um, problem. Some people are saying it's, uh, it's a crisis um, of homeless homelessness. How bad is the issue um, in in the state of California right now? How bad is this? How big of an emergency is it? This has been a problem that's been accumulating for decades. And it has become a particularly acute in California because of Prop 47 and Prop 57 which essentially legalized drug use and drug trafficking and stealing to support your drug habit. So many addicts from all over the country found their way to California, and that has swollen our our ranks on the streets, where now we're up around, you know, we're approaching 100,000 people that are ill, primarily with mental illness, and ill with medical issues that are going unattended because of their mental illness, and we're losing three people a day dying on the streets just in Los Angeles alone. Wow. I mean, before the coronavirus, you know, people were very, you know, these the, sounded like huge numbers, and, and they are, but it's suddenly, you know, sort of drifted into the background with our current crisis. 
you mentioned two props, and I'm not uh, super familiar with them. How did they how did they legalize drugs and legalize stealing uh, to support drug habits? Well, there's a Prop 57 allows you to steal, I think, up to $950, and it's strictly a misdemeanor. Oh. And uh, when you issue a misdemeanor citation to a drug addict, they, they don't show up. They don't show up for anything, you know, any of the, any of the legal consequence to that. They just go about their business. So uh, law enforcement has actually stopped even citing them because it's not even worth their time. Now, that has slowed down, again, in the coronavirus, but you could have stood in a target before the coronavirus crisis and just watched people walking out around the cashier all day long and they stopped fighting it because it was just no no point so uh that was this was all an attempt uh, in california to sort of deal with our overcrowding in our prisons so they you know essentially made crimes not crimes all of a sudden and legalizing drug use was thought to be somehow a compassionate uh law when in fact that's committing that's murder it's murder to legalize drugs uh, because you have people with an illness that, that goes unchecked will die. And rather than giving them consequences and motivating them into treatment, you're letting them just run their addiction and they will die. Do you think uh, the, the laws should be more like, you know, if you use drugs in your own private residence, you hurt yourself, that's different. But if you're in public, um, you know, it, you shouldn't be able to use these drugs. As I know here up here in the Bay Area, in San Francisco, I every single time I go up there to visit my brother who lives up there, I see at least one person almost almost every time openly shooting drugs into their you know their hand or their arm or their leg, and it's right there out in the open. To to me, there's no difference between out in the open and in a any in, indoors. It's all going to end up in death if you don't do something about it. Uh, so, I mean, there's a bunch of things we got to do. Mod modifying Prop 47, Prop 57 is just one of the things. I know uh, Dr. Ben Carson, who heads up uh, HUD, is very interested in modifying those laws because he, too, understands that that's the, one of the major contributors is drug addiction. And that is an illness and it is fatal. And we are allowing people to die of it in the name of what? In the name of some ideology? I, I mean, I've been dealing with drug addiction for 30 years. This is this is unconscionable, but that's just one piece. There's many pieces of this that are out of whack. What are some of the the the, the harms that we're seeing to just society at large from this epidemic? Are we starting to see, aside from the homeless themselves hurting themselves and dying and getting sick, are we starting to see ramifications to everyone else? So drug addiction is just one piece of this puzzle. The other piece is chronic mental illness. And in, you know, we, there's a whole history of, of how we have dismantled our uh, system for dealing with the chronically mentally ill. It goes actually back to the 1940s when a couple of uh, do-gooding psychiatrists, unelected officials, uh, three guys over the next 30 years determined the policy of the federal government around mental illness and their, pro and their sole goal, not their sole goal, their primary objective uh, all three of them, none of whom had ever been in a state mental hospital and worked or really had any experience with treating chronic psychiatric illness, their goal was to dismantle the state psychiatric system. Mm -hmm. So 150 years of, uh, of, of structured clinical psychiatric care was undone. And these people that need custodial care because of their brain disorders were set out into the streets uh, with no plan for how they would be dealt with. There was something called the Community Mental Health Act in the 1960s that President Kenny initiated that was uh, allegedly going to prevent mental illness and care on a community basis outpatient for uh, these patients, but uh, no provisions made for them. So they were all sent out into the streets, the nursing homes, and the prisons, which is where they ended up. And in addition to dismantling the, the infrastructure, we changed the laws around how you can help people whose brains aren't working right. It's the craziest thing of all time. Overnight, we went from need for care as the criteria for how you determine whether or not somebody needed psychiatric care. They needed care, that they got care. It, we switched it overnight with the, particularly in California, through the Lantern of Petra Short Act, into harm to self or other. That's a gigantic distance, gigantic distance. And so the people that are gravely disabled by their brain disorder are left out in the streets. Only if you have a psychiatric problem. If you have dementia, well, then we rush in and take care of them. 
But if you have a psychiatric illness that's affecting your brain function, well, then you're not allowed to touch people. And that is one of the most disturbing qualities of these laws. Dementias are progressive and inexorable. They go forward no matter what you do. And yes, a, a compassionate society goes in and takes care of people whose brains aren't working right. With psychiatric illness, somehow we stand back and go, oh, we can't touch them. They, they're, they're entitled to do whatever they want. They want to live on the streets. And we have thousands of family that go up to Sacramento on a regular basis and beg for help. They have resources. They have doctors. They have a place for their, their son or daughter to stay. But they can't bring them in because of the psychiatric illness. They can't touch them. They can't use law enforcement. And they're essentially every time told to take a hike. It's disgusting. And the psychiatric illnesses, the trajectory of those illnesses can be changed if you intervene. Unlike dementia, which even when you intervene, just keeps going. Psychiatric illness, the, the entire course can be changed if you intervene early and often. But we are allowing an entire generation to deteriorate on the streets. No other country does this. It's bizarre. We have to take care of sick people. Now, Dr. Drew, do we know how many or what percentage of the people that are on the street that actually are suffering from chronic mental illness? It's it's hard to get between drug addiction and mental illness. If you combine them, you get about 70 or 80 percent that that other 20 percent are people that are essentially transiently homeless. And the average duration on the street for that population is about three months. And those people use the resources. They're, they're happy to use resources that are available to them. They're cumbersome. They're difficult. We don't do a great job with it, but they use them and they get off the streets. The psychiatric patients and the and the drug addicts suffer from something called anisognosia. Anisognosia is, uh, is an old term uh, that describes how stroke patients perceive their disabilities. If you have a right-sided stroke in your brain, your left side of your body is out, you literally don't know it. And that's called anisognosia. Well, psychiatric patients and drug addicts have anisognosia to the, to the effects of their illness. Mm. They feel like they're doing fine. They just want to go out in the streets, just want to use. That is, a, that is the distortion of the brain disorders, and that is anisognosia. And if again, if somebody has dementia and anisognosia, we jump in. If they have a stroke and anisognosia, we drum, jump in because their brain isn't working right. I mean, if look, you give a directive to physician, every, you know, everyone is advised, in, particularly in California, to put in writing your directives to your doctor should you get into a condition when your brain isn't working right, mm. you end up on a ventilator from coronavirus. What do you? What are your directives to us when your brain doesn't work? We need something. We need the exact same directive for psychiatric care. We need a psychiatric directive to physicians. When somebody develops a major psychiatric illness, we need to sit down and go, okay, you will decompensate in the future. How would you like me to approach that? Do you want me to pull you in, keep you in a hospital, give you medication, make sure you get recompensated? Uh, and most people will say yes, of course, but we not we've not been doing that on a systematic basis, and that's one of the other things we need to do. As citizens, we're strongly led to believe by our politicians that the homeless issue is due to the cost of living in California that we don't have enough. Totally false. Totally ridiculous. Totally insane. I've been up. I've spoken on this in Sacramento. And they, they back down when I get up and show the evidence and give the history. That is a ridiculous... If you put these people in... First of all, they don't want to go indoors because of the anisognosia. Secondly, you put them indoors, they're going to die quicker. They have untreated mental illness. And unless we have a plan to deal with that and manage that, this will be a catastrophe. I cannot... I cannot it's unconscionable to me that they cling to this narrative about housing. Yes, we have a housing problem in California, and we have a problem with untreated mental illness and addiction. They are they, they overlap a bit, but they are not the same thing. Why then do they push that so hard? Why do they continue to push that we need to build more shelters, that we need to provide? We do need to build more shelters. We, we need more residential facilities. We, we need more, but they're talking about building affordable housing, and that. These people are, aren't appropriate for independent living. They, they, they need help. Maybe one day they will be, but in the meantime, they need a long-term residential care. And so, yes, another feature of what we need to do is build residential housing, residential treatment centers. We need to staff that up. 
and we are we are blocked from doing so by multiple issues. First of all, the Lantra and Petra Short Act prevents us from treating people. Secondly, there's something called the IMD exclusion, which is something that's been in pra- place since the early 60s, which is that Medicaid, Medicare will not pay for chronic psychiatric care. It's insane. I've been to Washington multiple times and advocated for this, and I get stonewalled. Uh, I, I make some progress with the economic people, the economics committees over at the White House, and then the legislature just stonewalls it. When you talk to uh, politicians and then you talk to the public, do you do they respond with by saying that what you're offering or, as solutions are maybe not compassionate? Like, why would you force people to to care, to get medical care when they don't want it? Why would you put people in jail for? harming themselves. Is that what happens? I wouldn't put people in jail. Okay. I, I, the, the, I agree with the fact that they, sh- they don't belong in jail. They do not belong in jail. But what are you doing with demented patients? Are you treating them? Mm. Leave them in the streets to, to die? What are you doing with people with encephalopathies? Leave them in the streets to die? Why do you treat psychiatric illness differently? It's all brain disorders. It all affects judgment. It all affects thinking. It all is fatal. Why in the world? Why in the world? It's no other country on earth does this. Mm. It, it's so bizarre. It's really bizarre. And anyone that's, you know, I worked in a psychiatric hospital for 30 years. Seeing my patients dying on the streets, it makes me jump out of my skin. Because your, your finger is on the pulse of this, are you seeing public opinion on our policy starting to sway and change? Are, are you seeing any headwind with this? We were making some progress uh, until the coronavirus thing. It, it sort of fed, it's, it sort of faded into the background. Um, I will tell you what happened in Los Angeles. Uh, it, it's it's shifting and changing, and so it's going to have to. We're going to have to sort of address this differently. So, so when the coronavirus hit, the gangs came off the streets. They were afraid of getting infected, so the drug suppliers dried up. Uh, and magically, the patients, be- the pe- patients on the street, the drug addicts, became willing to go indoors. Wow! So the governor, very nicely, very appropriately, uh, commandeered a bunch of hotels and motels and put several, a couple thousand indoors and put some trailers together. This would never have happened without without the drug supply d- drying up. Uh, so the drug addicts became motivated; uh, they became willing, uh, and they came indoors. And now we've got a problem where the gangs are going out there and now delivering and, and the liquor stores and the cannabis dispensaries and the gangs are now delivering directly to the uh, to the facilities where these guys are living. So I don't know quite how we're going to deal with that. And it's going to be an interesting uh, evolution, uh, at least at least the you know, the the homeless uh, professionals, the, you know, the social workers and psychologists that are working with them can get access to them on a little more consistent basis now. Let's see if we staff up adequately to meet the needs. They've not been doing that yet. I, I just read a, a report that um, that San, in San Francisco, they're providing alcohol, nicotine, and marijuana to- Correct. Uh, well, and that's true. Of course. Of course it's true. Wow, that's ins- true. That just there, sounds there, insane. There's nobody, nobody attempting to look. If you if you have a drug addict, or alcoholic, and you don't give them drugs and alcohol, they're going to find drugs and alcohol. That's what they do. That's what drug addicts do. They use drugs and alcohol. They don't stop just because you put them somewhere. They they are they're overwhelmed by a motivational disorder called addiction, and they will they will do anything to keep using. And they certainly won't stay in where you want them to stay if they can't get access to their substances. Then they go out to the streets. Wow. Okay. So now the the homeless uh, population would seem to be ex- exceptionally vulnerable to the the coronavirus uh, in terms of infection and death. I mean, they're they're not living in sanitary conditions. They're very close to each other. Um, are we seeing more infections and more deaths among that population versus the regular popula- population? This is a, a an interesting riddle to try to tease apart. Uh, the incidence is shockingly low, unless they're indoors. So it's it's evidence, which something I I suspect is true, that if you're outside, you can't. It's harder to very hard to transmit this thing. It doesn't transmit in the sunlight. It doesn't transmit in the outer doors. So requiring homeless to go into these recreational centers. It's it's a little bit it's weird, but it's a little concerning. So so and again in Southern California, they just require them to go in at night, and during the day they wander the streets and you know get to get through their thing. Um, 
I'm not sure that's a bad thing in terms of the coronavirus. There was an outbreak. Again, the outbreak was in one of the missions. Um, uh, something like 60% of their population were positive. And the vast, vast, vast majority, asymptomatic, which is kind of interesting. Hmm. So uh, I don't know what to make of that puzzle yet. Uh, it, it, you would think it would be a lot worse. You would think it would be a human, humanitarian catastrophe. you think it would rip through them and, and, and destroy them. That doesn't seem to be happening, at least not right now. But by, by virtue of us putting them indoors, we may inadvertently make things worse. It's do you crazy. do you think that maybe because the coronavirus did not start in the homeless uh, population that it was amongst you know everyday regular citizens, and that regular citizens, because they don't come in close contact on a regular basis with the homeless, that maybe they just didn't get it at the same time, and now that they're indoors and they're in more close contact with everyday people. That maybe they're being exposed more, maybe. But but then again, why why such a high incidence of asymptomatic? You know, why don't they get sicker? You would think they would, right? Even even the older ones are not getting sick. Uh, the older homeless folks. So it's I, I don't know what to make of it yet. I, that's something I'm looking at carefully. It, it's not it's not going bad the way we thought it would, which is kind of just by itself interesting. Wow. Okay. Uh, I'm going to take a little bit of a left and just ask you what your opinion is on the potential mental effects and maybe drug, you know, the subsequent, you know, increase in drug use and alcohol use that's going on right now because of the shelter in place and the situation. What, what does it look like from your perspective? Yeah, we don't, we don't know yet. Um, you know, I, I, I'm hearing, you know, we're going to see more drug use. We're going to see more. I think alcohol's up. There's no doubt about that. But whether we're going to see more uncontrolled alcohol use once things settle down, I, I don't know. We have to see the evidence once we get on the other side of this. We're all feeling anxious. We're all a bit dysphoric. But maybe there will be an exuberance on the other side where people will feel relief from this. I, I don't know. I, I would caution people from listening to too many just so descriptions of how things are. Of course, we're anxious. Of course, we're depressed. Is that going to be clinically relevant? I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I, I can tell you that drug addicts and alcoholics tend to get their act together during crises. They're, they're at their best during crises. So, and I'm seeing some of my patients get, get it together during all this. So I don't know. We'll, we'll see. Very interesting. Do, do you have any, any opinions on the, the, just the public policy around uh, the coronavirus in general, just the, how we've been you know, recommended to shelter in place, businesses can't open, do yeah. you have any comments on that? Uh, again, I have concerns. I, you know, I don't know, but I, I, I'm just asking questions. And the question I keep asking is, look at the homeless. They're better when they're out of doors. Why are you prevent? Why do you allow homeless to be out of doors and benefit from that? And citizens, you restrict them from that from that access. Uh, it's a bizarre. It, it's a really a common thing where homeless are allowed to do whatever, and citizens must comply with something much more stringent. And it may be harming the citizens, not allowing them to go outside and get some sunshine, vitamin D, UV light. All seem to be benefit for for this for this virus. The idea of sheltering in place, this is a new idea. It's never been done before. Do you understand? This is not as though this is the policy of infectious disease consultants throughout medical history. This is a new idea. Throughout medical history, you quarantined and isolated sick people. The only time in history that populations isolated was back in the Middle Ages when they hid in their houses from infections and it made things a lot worse. They hid inside with the respiratory viruses and with the rats and the rat droppings and the fleas. It made things a lot worse. The current policy was initiated, it, it, if you look at its history, it harkens back to a high school project of a 14-year-old girl in Albuquerque, Arizona, who built a model with influenza, which is transmitted by children and, and affects children very badly, influenza that if you stop, if you shut down schools, you could significantly decrease the rate of an outbreak. You can, you can flatten the curve, something we know. Her father was a computer modeler and built a bigger model off of that, and that became the provisional policy for pandemic of the Bush administration that they now are using. So to this, I've, I've talked to Charles Murray, University of Washington. I've talked to the clinical director of the LA County Department of Health. 
and ask them all the same question. How do we know that isolating in place is measurably different than social isolation, social distancing, mask wearing, hand washing? And every time I ask that question of an expert, they go, that's a great question. <laughs> it's a great question because they don't have an answer. Now, we are doing a giant experiment now. We're going to find out. I, I would urge people to look at Georgia. Georgia, if, if, for, if, if A, the virus doesn't get significantly uh, diminished by summer, which it might. It might just go away in the summer. Uh, if you look at Georgia, they picked the exact wrong moment to open up. They were accelerating in their cases. So if social distancing is measurably worse than isolation, we should really see a tick up in the next week or so at Georgia. So keep an eye on that. That will tell us whether there's really an advantage to isolating in place. Yeah, Sweden's another good example. They they had such a, a much more loose approach to how they handled the virus. And uh, of course, hindsight's going to be 2020. So it's going to be interesting to to look back and see if we made the the problem is of course uh, they'll I'm sure the argument will be well it could have been much worse which is I don't right. know how you could possibly beat that argument. That's right. There, there will there will never be an answer. People will just argue and spin on this forever. I, I would caution against comparing to Sweden. It's it's such a different situation. It's people live in different settings there. It's just very very different than here. Uh, but I, I understand what you're saying, and and that's you know I, again we don't know the answer to all this. And in the meantime, there, you know, the good news is therapeutics are advancing rapidly. Uh, I've dealt a lot with this case. Uh, the, when, when I, you know, early on, I was just asking people to calibrate their emotions because, you know, we'd just been through a pandemic in 2009 and no one even knew it. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I developed H1N1 swine flu. It was horrible. It was very contagious, but not as fatal as this one. Also, influenza kills 35 to 60,000 people every year, infects. 30, 30 million or so. That happens every year. People don't even know it's happening. So I was trying to get people to calibrate their emotional response to this. Uh, I will tell you, I've seen a few of the cases, you know, I've dealt with it quite a bit now. And man, if you check the risk box of metabolic syndrome, you have hypertension, hypercholesterolemia, you maybe have an antiphospholipid antibody, let's say you have central obesity, you get this thing, it is brutal. It is not the flu. It is something altogether different. Now we're beginning to zero in on the cytokine activation associated with this virus. There's CCR5 inhibitors, there's IL-6 inhibitors, there's JK inhibitors. So we're, you, we're sort of getting improvisational, which how we, him, we inhibit this cytokine cascade. I think we're going to get that in the next few weeks. And if we do, then that, that crazy syndrome where it just, just kills people in days, hopefully that will be uh, mitigated. Very interesting. So uh, one last question in regards to the, the homeless situation. Aside from uh, you know petitioning our politicians, uh, supporting some of the work that you're doing by getting these people to change our, public, our policies, is there anything that we can do as citizens and consumers to help the situation? Is it helpful when we give them money? Is that hurtful? Uh, are, what are some things that we can do now to help that situation, if anything at all? It is. Unfortunately, I don't know how you, as a, as a human, walk past these people and not give them money and food. But we are absolutely adversely affecting them. The food thing, there's too much food on the streets. We, now we have a rat explosion that is con carrying its own disease. As we had a typhus outbreak here in Southern California, which I knew would happen. We have millions of rats that are uh, with no policy for how to manage that. And there are more serious illnesses that follow on the heel of typhus. So that's coming. So the food, giving food ends up in the rats. Um, I, I, I don't know, you know, what we do that way. I, I will tell you there's uh, Senator Morlock, uh, State Senator Morlock has been proposing AB 640, which is to give families the capacity to bring their loved ones home. Uh and, you know, really pressure your state senators to to drop the ideology and be be clinical. I mean, you, you've been saying you want to follow the science on coronavirus, follow the science on mental illness. And, and don't and, and this ideology is just it's killing people in thousands. And how can how they can allow that to go on when there's easy fixes so we can use the law to help people get well from these mental illnesses? Uh, pressure your state representatives. They're the ones that can make the difference. 
Well, thank you very much. I really appreciate you uh, allowing us to interview you and, and ask you these questions. Again, we, we consider you to be the, one of the best voices uh, on this particular uh, situation. So thanks again, Dr. Drew. Well, I'm, I, you know, there's lots of ideas and, and I, I would say just, you know, one thing for sure, we, we got to juice up, we got to expand the facilities to be able to manage this. Uh, and that's a piece that nobody's looking at right now. And my fear is as we, you know, we're getting into deeper financial waters, uh, none of this is going to get dealt with. And you're going to see an acceleration of people dying on the streets uh, of illnesses that Everywhere on the earth, all other illness, all the country treat sick people. We, when your brain gets sick, decide, oh, no, no, that's different. We can't treat that. Unbelievable. Thanks again. Thanks, guys. Are you guys as frustrated as I was listening to, to Dr. Drew talk about like the, the real cause of this, this oh, problem? I think I was clenching my teeth that entire time, just he, in anger. Oh, I could feel you over there because I know you you have already expressed your your issues that you have up in Santa Cruz because it's got you've watched it in your Yeah, it's it's visibly right in front of me every day. And and you can see the problem. It it's it's drugs and it's mental illness. And I, I just I get so mad that we're not like addressing that head on. That's that's what we need to focus on. Yeah, I think the big problem, and this is this is not just a problem with uh, this particular situation. This is a problem that happens with a lot of different kinds of policies. Is that politicians pass feel good laws that do not produce good results. So when they get up to get elected, they'll say things like uh, being homeless shouldn't be a crime or you know, if you, you know, we shouldn't, we shouldn't uh, spend money on treating these people. It's their choice, or we feel bad for them, and it's because we don't have uh, cheap housing. That's the reason. Mm -hmm. And it's if if it feels good, mm -hmm. it sounds good, but the results are the exact opposite. It's the opposite. I've lived in California my entire life, and before my eyes, I have seen in the last like five years, the homelessness population. Explode! I've never seen in San Jose ever. I've lived here my entire life, right? I've never seen tent cities mm -hmm. in this in this in the city. Never. And now yeah. there are. I mean, if I'm when I'm driving to work, I see at least two or three of them. It's everywhere on the way to work. It's it's crazy. It's it's insane to me. It, but it, what was really uh, infuriating is that he's talking about this kind of stuff and. They don't like. I don't. I don't want to take them seriously, and it's kind of weird. Right? I was surprised by the percentage. I didn't realize that. And you've alluded to it before. You've never actually dropped a percentage on. I know we've talked off air before about this. That that many of them are suffering from a mental illness. Mm -hmm. I was. I was not uh, privy to that. I was. I was under the impression that maybe a smaller percentage had mental illness, and then the the rest of them either one chose to do that, or like he said, in transient, where they're in between. Uh, houses and they just choose to go do that. I didn't realize that you're talking about close to 80% of the people that are suffering from a mental illness. Yeah, That's and they have tough. nowhere to go. You know, there's no like treatment facility uh, for certain types of mental illness. Like they just, I mean, they don't really have an answer or, you know, a place besides like, you know, you know, let's give them their own spot to kind of figure this out. It's like, let's get them treatment. Like, what does that look like? And why don't we have that? Uh, established here in, in California, well, they especially. Don't, they don't even know that they need treatment. You know, I forgot the term he used, but um, it was like, you know, when you're mentally ill and you don't know you need help. Yeah. So they won't even seek it out because they have no idea that they're that as bad uh, as they are. But statistically speaking, people without mental illness and without major drug abuse issues who are homeless do not remain homeless for very long. This is a, 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 a statistic across the U.S. If if somebody does become homeless, typically it's a, it's a it's a couple months. They end up on a person's couch. They end up in a shelter. Mm -hmm. They get back on their feet. It's it's rarely a permanent problem for people who aren't uh, mentally ill who don't have a drug. Yeah, what did you say? Issue. Three months was a typical. Yeah, if, if it, the, all those cases you weren't a drug addict or you didn't have uh, you know mental illness, it was about that time. Yeah. Now what was was uh, and you know I've seen videos of this by the way. Um, uh, my brother sends these to me because he lives up in the city. And it's videos from people who work in like Walgreens or Target or whatever. Yeah. And they're literally filming because they can't do anything. They're just they, stealing, right? Mm -hmm. Oh, they'll go in with like garbage bags and just just put, you know, deodorants and hairsprays and whatever in the bags. They know the exact amount. Yes. As long as it's under, what do you say, 900 something dollars? 900, yeah. 50 and then they'll just walk out. And the reason why they let them is because when, if they stop them, the cops 
let them basically, oh, put up, you know, and then they come back and do it again. And he said that he's seen them do this, walk around the corner, put the deodorants out on the street and sell them for like 50. So they're literally stealing the stuff and then selling it around the corner for 50 cents a piece, yeah. making their money to feed their drug habit. And that, I mean, yeah. that's going to destroy fix this problem. We're going to allow more crime. Yeah. And that's going to destroy the, the, the city because um, I know if I'm not mistaken, Walgreens is like telling the city, we're going to start pulling our stores if you don't handle this there's no why, why would we have our stores here yeah. if you guys are gonna keep doing this yeah and it's unfortunate that you know all that momentum kind of going up into this specific issue kind of got halted because the coronavirus came through and it's like it's very much downplayed now that's yeah. that's on everybody's top of mind Dude, how about how crazy that was he was saying oh, that, that yeah. a smaller percentage of the homeless are getting affected with coronavirus than uh, everyone else. That's well, really interesting. And I know he said to caution about what people are saying about predictions of what's going to happen because of COVID, but I, I can't help but think about that. I can't help but, I mean, I just read that thing in Australia, the report that was coming out that they're, the prediction of suicide rate, and, and I, you got to think the homelessness that's going to that's gonna skyrocket here in about 30 days when mm -hmm. they pull the moratorium on evictions. How many people are going to be on the streets because of that? And, and I know that these aren't the mental illness people and the people that he's probably really concerned about, but I would think that would just make the problem 10x because of that. Well, I think if you're yeah. depressed, anxious, lost your job, lost your house, a, per a percentage of those people might turn to uh, drugs, mm -hmm. which then could fuel latent, you know, mental illness or create uh, mental illness, uh, you know, problems. So yeah. I think you might be right, Adam. Uh, with that one, but you know, what sucks is there's not a whole lot of stuff that we can do aside from. Well, yeah, that's I. I it's really this is a really mm -hmm. tough one for me to even talk about. Um, yeah. You know, I'm, I was sitting there listening to him, and and I'm like, everything I'm hearing him say, like I, I agree, and he and he's right, but then I also feel like yeah. we have what's the solution? Yeah, there's no solution. I, don't know. I can't. It, so for me, I struggle when we talk about a topic like this that I feel like nobody has the real answer. And it's it's strange to me because it almost, if you unpack something and go deep enough, especially when it comes to uh, situations like this, it almost always has something to do with money, right? Mm -hmm. It's where we're not going to make money off of it or it's going to cost too much money. And it's weird to me that we wouldn't just create, I mean, the, the government loves to create new new uh, subsidies like why wouldn't we do that in this situation and why is it keeping them from from legislating that i don't understand it doesn't make sense it doesn't to me. feel good so if you're a politician in san francisco and you come out and say we're going to make drug use on the street illegal and we're going to you know if you steal you're going to be it's going to be a felony then they're going to come out and say that's not well, that, you know that's not nice and, and you know that's mean and because it's, it's like punching down Right. Yeah like, yeah. like people that are already down and out and now we're going to arrest them for, you know, their problems. Like it doesn't feel as good. Yeah. As yeah but the answer is to not to not do anything is not a better answer. Yeah. Make mind. it worse. No, right. it's not. It's not. It doesn't a better, work. It's not a better answer. No, at all. The, the one thing that he said uh, towards the end there was he talked about all the uh, the, the other core morbidity, uh, co comorbidities that that dramatically increase the, the, the negative symptoms or the, the potentially fatal symptoms. Of COVID, and he named a bunch that were related to just poor metabolic health and obesity, mm -hmm. and that uh, that is right along the lines of all the other stuff that I've been reading. I know in New York, I think they said that that was the number one, you know, uh, number one reason that people would get COVID and die from it. It was all related to obesity and obesity related. Um, diseases, which, which would explain why a lot of the homeless are not, because when was the last time you saw an obese homeless person? Maybe, yeah, yeah that might be. And they're exposed to the elements a lot more and getting sunlight. And I don't, I thought that was interesting about people being outside a lot more versus inside. Like this is a grand experiment keeping everybody yeah. inside. It does make me wonder if how much weaker people's immune systems are if because they've been at home, maybe eating worse, right? Maybe drinking more alcohol, not getting as much vitamin D from sunlight. Mm -hmm. Then they're reopening. So now we're re-entering into exposing ourselves with a weaker immune system potentially. Is that going to cause you know more problems? Right. I don't know. Very interesting. But again, very interesting episode. And uh, I, I wish we could have more solutions. I know. But what I really hope is that people listening get uh, as enraged as I am or at least motivated enough to tell your politicians. And what ends up happening, if the politicians see that there's enough people talking about this, it then becomes beneficial for them to run on a different policy. So I think they need to know mm -hmm. that if they run on different policy, that they'll get elected. And if they don't, 
that they won't get elected or definitely not get reelected. That's the big one. I think the people, especially in California, it, they should get them all out because they've already caused this problem and send a big signal to uh, you know to to our local governments and to the state and even federal governments that you know you you mess this problem up, you're not going to get reelected and we're going to kick you out. Uh, and with that, go to mindpumpfree.com, download all of our guides, resources, and books. You can also find the three of us on Instagram. You can find Justin at Mind Pump Justin, me at Mind Pump Sal, and Adam at Mind Pump Adam. Thank you for listening to Mind Pump. If your goal is to build and shape your body, dramatically improve your health and energy, and maximize your overall performance, check out our discounted RGB Super Bundle at mindpumpmedia.com. The RGB Super Bundle includes MAPS Anabolic, MAPS Performance, and MAPS Aesthetic. Nine months of phased expert exercise programming designed by Sal, Adam, and Justin to systematically transform the way your body looks, feels, and performs. With detailed workout blueprints and over 200 videos, the RGB Super Bundle is like having Sal, Adam, and Justin as your own personal trainers, but at a fraction of the price. The RGB Super Bundle has a full 30-day money-back guarantee, and you can get it now plus other valuable free resources at mindpumpmedia.com. If you enjoy this show, please share the love by leaving us a five-star rating and review on iTunes and by introducing Mind Pump to your friends and family. We thank you for your support, and until next time, this is Mind Pump.